my name is Gordon Menzies and I'm a specialist regulatory barrister with a particular interest uh, and experience in the health and safety uh, law. And the title of today's presentation is uh, The Devil is in the Detail. And the purpose is to look at constructive and positive ways of presenting financial evidence uh, to a court in a health and safety case during a sentencing exercise. Practitioners will, of course, be familiar with the expectation, indeed the requirement, to provide three years of accounts uh, to the court prior to that sentencing hearing, because as the Sentencing Council guidelines state, uh, in the absence of such disclosure, or where the court is not satisfied that it has been given sufficient reliable information, the court will be entitled to draw reasonable inferences as to the offender's means from evidence that is heard and from all the circumstances of the case, which may include the inference that the offender can pay any fine. And certainly the practice uh, has been indeed it's almost become a convention that no matter how big or small a company you are, uh, financial information uh, of some degree is placed before the court. There are particular contexts in which the guidelines make it clear that detailed analysis is not encouraged and indeed may not even be appropriate. For example, cases involving uh, breaches by local authorities, by healthcare trusts, and of course, charities are the type of cases where the guidelines are explicit that detailed analysis uh, may not be necessary nor indeed um, helpful. So, this presentation is largely focused on those kind of cases which involve larger and purely commercial undertakings. The challenge for the practitioner in these types of cases is to ensure that the perhaps natural focus on turnover is not at the expense of the wider aspects of the financial picture of a company. The position is that this uh, emphasis on turnover is something which lawyers uh, find easy to grapple with, but is something that an accountant perhaps would uh, find less easy to understand. Of course, turnover is the starting point for the court and indeed uh, the lawyer, because it is this figure which will generally determine uh, the starting point and indeed the category range when it comes to applying the sentencing guidelines. However, the important thing to remember is even at this stage, the guidelines refer to turnover or its equivalent. And that caveat is sometimes overlooked because there will be cases, cases generally involving uh, larger operations which take the form of various asset investment activities the most obvious example being a property investment uh, company, where although the turnover may be actually quite small, the real wealth and the real measure of the size of the company is in its assets. Uh, you will have occasions where uh, a property uh, portfolio will be very valuable, but actually the rents received once uh, applicable costs and deductions uh, and liabilities have been taken into account, um, result in a situation where actually the profit is actually quite marginal. And the turnover itself may be a figure which is uh, less striking than perhaps the assets uh, figure would uh, tend to suggest. Therefore, turnover, of course, is the start, uh, but it is by no means the end. And one other associated issue that there may be uh, arises in relation to associated companies. 
because the guidelines state that normally only information relating to the organization before the court will be relevant unless exceptionally it can be demonstrated that the resources of a linked organization are available and can properly be taken into account. Practitioners will be familiar with the case of Tata Steel and that considered this particular part of the guidelines. Those that are familiar with the case will know that the defendant at Tata Steel UK was a wholly owned subsidiary of Tata Steel Limited. The UK uh, subsidiary had a very large turnover and was, as per the accounts, operating at a substantial loss. Notwithstanding that substantial loss, the account still recorded that um, for the appropriate purposes, it could still be treated as a going concern because, uh, and only because, it had the financial support and availability of the resources of its parent. When considering the approach to be taken to identifying the significance of the parent's role in these kind of contexts, the Court of Appeal observed that on this footing, it seems to us that this is one of those exceptional cases within step two, where the resources of Tata Steel Limited, as well as those of uh, the subsidiary Tata Steel UK Limited, can be properly taken into account. Indeed, as the support of the parent is plainly of the first importance in ensuring that Tata could continue to prepare its accounts on a going concern basis, it would seem to be wrong not to take the position of the parent into account. The removal of the parent's resources would produce a misleading and unrealistic picture of the subsidiary's financial circumstances. This is not a matter, the Court of Appeal observed, of penalising uh, the parent for keeping the subsidiary in business to the benefit of employees and the community at large. It is, in the Court of Appeal's view, simply recognising the economic reality of the situation. Be all that as it may, the Court of Appeal continued, on any view, the judge was amply entitled to take uh, TSLs, that is the parents' resources, into account when considering whether or not to make a downwards adjustment in the light of Tata's financial circumstances. The important point as far as that case is concerned is to not overlook the fact that even the sentencing judge did not take the parents' resources into account at the very initial stage of assessing the defendant's uh, own turnover. The argument on appeal was that the judge should have ignored this external financial support at a later stage when the court is bound to look at the economic realities of the um, organization and whether its profit margins were such and so low that they would justify a downward adjustment of the overall fine. So it's important that although the Court of Appeal was referring to a general principle which could be applied at an early stage of the exercise, that was not the context in which their comments were made. So practitioners will immediately identify, if they haven't already, that there is a tension here. On one hand, there is the position at law, the position that we are all taught at the beginning, that each company is a separate legal identity and should be treated as such. And the other uh, competing interests that, of course, a broad purpose of approach to health and safety enforcement has to be taken and that sentencing in its very broadest terms has to look at all the circumstances in a very wide context in order to achieve its aims and achieve justice.
Therefore, the suggestion for the practitioner is that dealing with this issue should be treated as a, an evidential exercise. Is there actually sufficient evidence for the court to be satisfied that this is one of these exceptional cases where the resources of a linked organization can be taken into account? And in Tata, the evidence was there. It was there in the accounts. And from that, a particular picture uh, emerged and a very clear picture, which evidentially it can be understood why that particular test was met. So if practitioners are going to look at this in terms of an evidential exercise, the first question is, does uh, the evidence that's available actually paint a sufficiently clear picture that could justify a finding or a set of findings of facts which would then allow the court to treat this as an exceptional case? And if that uh, picture is clearly painted by the accounts, whether, particularly if you're defending, you want to consider giving uh, explanatory evidence, whether by external statement or otherwise from management or an external source, to actually put those figures in context and make it uh, perhaps clear that uh, the picture painted by the accounts may not, in fact, be the correct one. Tata was uh, treated as a very large organization for the purposes of the guidelines. It had a turnover of uh, 4 billion. Now, this presentation is not about uh, very large organizations and not about the authorities which deal with that question. But uh, those practitioners who deal with this uh, issue uh, on a day-to-day -day basis will know that the courts, while laying down broad brush uh, guidance in terms of setting out a framework for looking at this issue and looking at the consequences of the issue, the approach has never been prescriptive and indeed has been very much one which is of you know it when you will see it. So that is uh, a few observations on uh, the starting point and the importance of turnover, uh, especially at step two of the sentencing exercise. However, the important, uh, the more, perhaps potentially more important part of the exercise where detailed uh, examination of accounts may repay close consideration is at steps three and four of the exercise, particularly step three, because of course step three is a check on whether the proposed fine based on turnover is proportionate to the overall means of the offender. So here the focus is very much on the means of the offender. Step four is a, a more wider uh, consideration that looks at whether the fine impairs the offender's ability to make restitution to victims, what impact a fine may have on the offender's ability uh, to improve conditions and comply with the law, and the impact that any fine may have on the employment of staff, service users, customers, and the local economy. So having looked to the definitions of steps three and four, it's clear that the information in the set of accounts is going to be more relevant to step three than step four. So the issues that uh, bear consideration as far as step three are concerned are, as far as uh, my experience has been as follows. First, and perhaps most importantly, profitability. There is a real danger given the tendency of the courts to focus on turnover. The profitability is sometimes lost. The whole purpose of the sentencing exercise is to take into account the economic realities of the business. And uh, 
to reach a fine which is sufficiently uh, large to bring the message home to management and also to the shareholders. So hence, that is why submissions on profitability are, in my uh, submission, something which should not be shied away from, something which uh, merits proper emphasis in the context of the sentencing exercise. A defence practitioner may have limited scope for arguing about how big a company is in terms of the approach which is referred to at the beginning of the sentencing exercise, but is on much surer ground when he or she reaches step three of the exercise, where the overall means is something which the court needs to be very much alive to. And uh, certainly my experience has been welcomes uh, assistance as far as the accounts are concerned. Because the turnover is very much a figure which represents the beginning of the financial picture of a company's position. But it's the after-tax position which reflects uh, the end of uh, that particular presentation of uh, the company's financial health. And that certainly uh, it is open to a properly worded defence submission is something which is as important, if not more so, than any focus on turnover at the beginning of the exercise. So the consideration for the practitioner is to look at profitability and also use it in combination with the other financial aspects as disclosed by the accounts to paint a proper and fair picture of what this company's financial health really is. And in order to do that, uh, the practitioner may benefit from looking at the detail of the accounts, the extent that, for example, the provisions that are sometimes detailed in accounts may uh, be important. For example, it may be that the provisions actually include some set aside for payment of the fine itself. Clearly, that is going to be relevant to what means are available to pay any fine is something that a prosecutor is going to look at and a defence practitioner certainly needs to be aware of given the potential for undermining any argument that this uh, defendant is in a financial position where a large fine is not going to be something which um, is uh, merited. Director's remuneration is another issue that needs to be considered. It is something which certainly uh, the prosecution may wish to draw the uh, court's attention to. And it's certainly something that the sentencing guidelines themselves identify as being important for the purposes of any sentencing exercise. Here, close consideration of director's remuneration uh, pays off because an otherwise uh, impressive figure has to be seen in context, in particular how many directors there actually are, but more importantly, the commercial context in which such uh, payments may be made. Because again, it may well be that figures which appear quite large and black and white on paper are in the commercial context in which uh, that business operates, uh, either modest or simply competitive uh, compared to other competitors in the industry. Another uh, aspect that bears consideration is the issue of dividends. Um, again, this is often overlooked because the purpose of sentencing is to bring the message home, not just to management, but also to the shareholders. And if you are in a position where the dividends uh, may be modest, as far as the shareholders are concerned, then that may be a factor 
which allows a submission to be made uh, to the effect that the fine does not merit um, a figure which it may otherwise do given the uh, somewhat modest returns to shareholders. Pension provisions is another aspect that can be drawn out of the accounts to show that this is a company which cannot simply be judged on its turnover. In the same way as loan accounts are important in assessing the overall financial health of a company, pension provisions too are relevant. And again, both those factors are something which are often uh, overlooked. Those kinds of liabilities are as important, not just to the accountant, but to management, and they should be uh, to the court when it comes to forming a proper view of the type of company this actually is. So if all those considerations and factors are fed into an argument about profitability, in particular when there is a low margin of profit, it may well be that a judge is receptive to arguments which suggest downward adjustment in the starting points and the figures suggested by the category range at the beginning of the exercise are justified. I touched on step four uh, previously and given the approach that is taken in the guidelines, it's a much more focused uh, exercise than at step three. It's a much more narrower consideration than the broader considerations at step three. So there is likewise uh, a more limited uh, opportunity for the advocate to uh, make a difference at this stage. However, they still would be important. As far as the fine's effect on the ability to provide a service or its impact on customers or the public is concerned, that is something which, for example, may be very important as far as a local authority is concerned should they find themselves in front of a sentencing judge. Clearly, in the context of a profit-orientated commercial undertaking, such arguments require careful consideration. And uh, should it be proposed that they are pursued, a healthy degree of scepticism may be expected from the judge, which would require some kind of cogent evidence, again, preferably from an external source, whether it be accountant or auditor, in order to give those arguments sufficient weight that they may actually tell in the final outcome represented by the figure of the fine. So the conclusion that this presentation offers is as follows. To simply extract a turnover figure from the accounts and look no further is an approach which is something which may be understandably perfectly natural, especially for a busy court dealing with a potentially complex case with other issues. However, careful consideration needs to be given to the constituent elements of the accounts so that the focus is not lost on the other issues which are potentially actually much more significant to the sentencing exercise and turnover, in particular profitability. The other advantage of a careful consideration of these types of factors is that in addition to a specific submission that there should be a downward adjustment from any starting point that the judge may have in mind. It is also important because it lends color to the other more general type of submissions, which go to the nature and type of company that you may be uh, representing. Ultimately, the aim is that these submissions can assist 
not just in rebutting any implicit suggestion that a, an organization has in some way been blinded to health and safety by its pursuit of profit, but can actually go further to demonstrate as part of the overarching submissions that this is a company which is sensibly managed, its cognizance of its role, not just in economic terms, but its role in the wider community as well. And if you're able to use those elements in the accounts to assist and complement arguments which are based on a proper appraisal of a company's true approach to its business and to health and safety in particular, you may find such arguments being met with receptive ears uh, and hopefully with cogent results. Mm -hmm.